In the beginning, all animals and humans were vegetarians, and so someone may ask you, well, if they ate plants, isn't that death? Wasn't there no death in the beginning? How did plants survive the global flood? So if the islands were a post-flood formations, how did plants arrive to the Galapagos Islands? How do we get from a barren landscape, from a volcanic eruption, to a complex ecosystem? We're gonna talk a little bit about plant diversity in the Galapagos and the vegetation zones we see. Um, Galapagos is very unique in that they have very distinct vegetation zones, which leads to different climate zones so that different plants with different adaptations can live in different areas. And so we'll kind of explore this for the next 45 minutes or so. And what better place to start than at the beginning? And so we know from the <laughs> biblical <laughs> account of creation about 6,000 years ago that God commanded the dry land and plants to form on day three. And specifically in Genesis 1, 11 through 12, it says, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and the fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed, each according to its kind. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And so when we talk about kinds a lot, a lot of times we just talk about dogs, like Dr. Rivera talked about the other day, or cats. But also it applies in the plant world too, right? So a pollen from a member of the bean family, legume legumaceae, cannot pollinate a flower from the rose family. And so we see the same kind of trends in the plant world too, where these can only reproduce according to their own kind. And as we said previously, is the family level classification. This is the classification level from Linnaean taxonomy, which once again is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so we see these same trends where in the beginning, God created plants according to their own kind. So you might also get asked, well, you know, in the beginning, we know that Adam and Eve ate plants, right? It says in Genesis 1, 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree which seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And so uh, in the beginning, all animals and humans were vegetarians. And so someone may ask you, well, you know, if they ate plants, isn't that death? Wasn't there no death in the beginning? Well, the word for humans, or first the humans and animals in the Bible, the Hebrew word is nephesh, and this implies breath of life. And so this breath of life implies like a living soul as in humans. This is not the same word that we see in plants. And so therefore we conclude that, well, if they ate plants, this is not the same death that we would have in humans and animals. And then, of course, the earth became very um, wicked, and the Lord um, sent a worldwide, f or sin entered the world first, right? And then, as a result, we see thorns, thistles, poisonous plants. And so, because when sin entered the world, we now see this in the plant kingdom as a result. And the earth became very wicked, and only eight humans survived the global flood. And we read this in Genesis 1.29, where it says that, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort. But what is the one thing we don't see, right, referred to when God brought the animals on the ark is plants. So it doesn't refer that, it doesn't tell us that God told Noah to bring plants. It doesn't say that, you know, go collect two of every kind of plant. So it, since scripture doesn't exactly tell us, we have some ways to determine, well, how did plants survive the global flood? And interestingly, God did provide plants with unique mechanisms to survive various conditions that we would see during a global flood. And the first one we're going to talk about is on the ark. Though God did not command Noah to take plants in the Bible, we can assume that since they ate fed, you know, food, plant foods, people would have, the people, the eight people on the ark, would have taken plant foods on the ark for him and his, Noah and his family to eat and for the animals to eat also. Whether it's through the garden or preserved plant foods, they probably would have taken something. And additionally, through the animals. So any seeds that the um, animals would have eaten on the ark could have been deposited on the land when the waters receded. Or um, they could have been, seeds could have been attached to fur if it was in the ark somehow. Um, and so through the people and the animals, we can say that some plants might have arrived on earth after the flood through this way. Secondly, some studies have shown that plants can actually survive in water and salt water. So remember our friend Charles Darwin? Well, he actually did a study and concluded that plant seeds could sustain long periods in water. He did this study to show how plants could arrive to the Galapagos Islands, but it actually shows how plants could have survived a global flood. George Howe also did a study and showed that plant seeds, after soaking for 140 days, could also germinate and continue to grow. And we know that the waters just, uh, were over the face of the earth for about 100 50 days. And so it's possible that the seeds could have survived in the salt water during this time. 
Next, plant seeds could have also survived on floating vegetation. We know that the um, waters came up from the deep, and so there was a lot of water flow. Um, this could have brought things to the surface, whether it was floating vegetation mass or animal bodies, whatnot. We could have seen plant seeds surviving on these, but also beginning to germinate and grow on like old logs, like seen in this picture where plants are growing from an old log that's in the middle of a lake. And so when we think of the global flood, we also think of volcanic activity, right? Because it tells us that waters came up from the surface of the deep. Which brings us to the Galapagos Islands, which is a volcanic archipelago. As we've talked about previously, this means that it was formed by volcanic activity. And we know that there's a lot of volcanic activity in the, uh, during the flood because of the fossil record also. And, but we can also say that the Galapagos Islands is a post-flood formation. Now it's possible that since it is formed by a hot spot underneath the mantle, that there were seamounts left after the flood, and seamounts are underground volcanoes. But the Galapagos Islands were most likely formed um, after the flood, so about 4,500 years ago. And so, how exactly did the Galapagos Islands form? Well, as I said previously, the islands are over what's known as a hot spot, which is just a lot of lava in one area under the mantle. And this erupts, or the lava comes to the surface, and the volcano erupts. And when the lava touches the water, it solidifies and forms what we see as islands or volcanoes. Eventually, the plate moves, and this volcano is no longer active, but the hot spot continues to erupt. And so another island formation or volcano will form, and eventually, as the plate moves, we begin to see a chain of islands, which is what we see in the Galapagos Islands. And so here we are the Galapagos Islands. They are on the Nazca Plate, which is the tectonic plate. And we see the plate moving slowly in this direction towards the um, perimeter of South America, towards Ecuador. And so because of this, we know that San Cristobal is the oldest and Isabella is the youngest island. Additionally, there are seamounts found in the front of San Cristobal, once again, underground volcanoes, showing that there was previous ac volcanic activity from the hot spot in front of San Cristobal. And so eventually, as the plate moves, the islands will go back under the water, and new island will be formed, which we still see today. Volcan Wolf, or Wolf Volcano, is still actively erupting. The last biggest eruption, I think, was in 2022. And so we see active island formation today. And so we can now know that this is how the Galapagos Islands formed. Once again, there are several active volcanoes still in the Galapagos Islands, and there continues to be active island formation. So if the islands were a post-flood formations, how did plants arrive to the Galapagos Islands? Very similar to the global flood, um, we can see sea, or seeds could have arrived in the sea currents. There is a neat, unique um, combination of both hot and cold currents, and these could have brought plant seeds to the Galapagos Islands floating in the water. If we think of a coconut palm, the coconut palm is very hardy and resistant to a lot of water. And once again, those previous studies show that seeds are capable of sustaining salt water um, survival. Additionally, wind dispersal, especially ferns, mosses, and lichens, they disperse through what are known as spores. If you ever looked underneath a fern leaf, we can see spores underneath. And this is, um, they could have flown through the wind. So the wind could have brought the spores of ferns, mosses, or lichens to the islands. Additionally, remember our tortoises? Well, animal hosts could have brought plant seeds to the islands in either di the digestive tract or the fur. Remember we learned how tortoises can float in the water? Well, if when the tortoise arrived, he could have deposited some plant seeds and then we have some plants on the island. So various animals could have also brought these, brought these plants with them. And finally, human introduction. So um, the Galapagos were first discovered in 1535, and since that time, species have begun, of every organism, have begun to be introduced into the islands. And we especially see this steep incline run over here when um, permanent settlers began to arrive in the Galapagos, bringing all kinds of species with them, both plants and animals. And so we know how plants have arrived to the Galapagos Islands, but how do we get from a barren landscape, from a volcanic eruption, to a complex ecosystem? This is actually a picture I took when I was in Sierra Negra, which we're going to go to later on. And so this is an active volcano. And so we see this barren lava rock formation. But then this picture in San Cristobal is in the highlands, where we see a very complex ecosystem of many plants, water, land formations, and animals. And so we're going to talk briefly about soil formation. So soil formation forms through the breakdown of rocks. And as we learned previously, lava rock is very fertile, or creates fertile soil. And so first you have this introduction of mosses and lichens, things that can grow on the rocks and begin breaking down the so soil. And then you have the introduction of what's known as a pioneer species. And pioneer species are the species that first come into an environment when there is a disruption like lava formation. And so um, 
these are smaller, or the lava, pioneer species in this case would be small like the lava cactus. Then eventually you get introduction of grasses and small flowering plants before eventually you get more larger trees and shrubs creating this complex ecosystem. Regarding pioneer species, um, here are three pioneer species. I have seen two of them so far, and if you're interested, I can point them out to you. We probably won't get to see the lava cactus, Brachiocereus nesioticus, but the Sullivan flower and the gray mat plant are currently in our ecosystems, or in the lower ecosystems, in the dry lowlands, and we can see them. I saw them in San Cristobal. But the gray mat plant and the Sullivan flowers, once again, they act by, they come into this rock formation and they begin to break down the rocks into more um, fertile soil so that more complex plants can move into. And when regarding plants, it's important also to mention that there are two primary seasons in the Galapagos. We have the wet hot season and the dry cold season where the temperatures do fluctuate a little, but relatively the temperature stays pretty constant throughout the year. And um, because of this combination of seasons, we also see the complex ecosystems where we get to talk about, um, where we get to see very specific plants in their ecosystems. And then briefly, I'm going to talk about two plant adaptations that are unique to the Galapagos Islands, too. So one is, if you've noticed, and we talked about this a little bit with our guide, is most of the plants have small white and yellow flowers. And this is due to a lack of pollinator arrival issues to the Galapagos Islands. One of the primary and only native um, pollinators to the Galapagos is the Galapagos carpenter bee. There are other pollinators like other birds. But the Galapagos carpenter bee is one of the only native and primary pollinators. And so because of this, when plants arrived at the Galapagos, there were no pollinators to pollinate their flowers. And so rather than expending their energy right on larger flowers to attract pollinators, because that's their purpose, you know, they ex put their energy towards other functions. And a lot of the plants we also see here are self-pollinating or autogamous. So they're able to pollinate their own flowers either on the same plant or they pollinate the same species but a different plant member. And so, once again, this is because of arrival issues. So when the plants first arose, there were no pollinators, and so they pollinated themselves. Or the plants that couldn't pollinate themselves didn't survive. Um, another cool plant adaptation we see is their ability to withstand plant adaptations, um, or sorry, salt water, and especially for the coastal plants and the mangroves, right? There's a lot of mangroves around here. And so the mangroves grow in the salt water and it's really neat because they're able to absorb the salt water and exude it. Um, one species, the white mangrove, releases it on its leaves. Um, so they absorb the salt water and then as the salt water evaporates, it leaves the salt on the leaf surface. Other mangrove species are also able to just eject the salt right out of their roots after they absorb it. And I think it's also really interesting because Darwin himself, when he came to the Galapagos, was very unimpressed with the plants, and he called them wretched little things. And so it's just really funny because, you know, these plants have so many cool adaptations, and we're going to see are very unique. Um, but Darwin didn't like them, and so let's get into the vegetation zones. <laughs> so in the Galapagos, too, we have very unique ecosystems. Um, and there is actually what's known as a rain shadow. So because of the way that the islands are, the winds hit on the, or there's a rain shadow on the southern side. And so when the wind blows and the rain comes down on this side, and as a result, we see larger um, area in the arid zone and the transition zone and the scalacea zone. And I'm going to go through each of these zones and talk about what makes them this zone, what is unique, and what plant species we can find there. Um, but this rain shadow also causes the arid transition and scalacea zone to encompass larger area and then um, cause there to be more moisture than on this side. <coughs> and additionally, the brown zone is also only found in Santa Cruz. This is in reference to the epiphytes, and epiphytes are um, like, like lichens that grow on tree branches, so they don't need to grow, and orchids do this too, they grow on tree branches, they don't need to grow in the soil directly, they can grow on like a host plant. Um, and so the brown zone refers to the epiphytes turning brown in the dry season in this zone. Um, and it's only in Santa Cruz, it's also the population, I guess, of the brown zone, the area is decreasing currently in Santa Cruz. And so the vegetation zones, I am gonna refer to them as these names. Um, so the more typical names are the previous slide. These, when I took, when I was here previously, this was, these were the ecological zones I used in my class, and they're, I feel like they're more descriptive, so I'm gonna use these. And typically, they are grouped into three main zones. It's the coastal zone, the arid zone, and then the moist uplands. So we're gonna begin with the Galapagos mangrove, and we're gonna describe it all the way to the human highlights. In the Galapagos Islands, it's a very characteristic of dry weather and low precipitation, but also having a lot of saltwater adaptations. Remember we talked about that very specific plant adaptation that many of the plants here do have. 
some indicator species we can find is mangroves, right? This is the mangrove, uh, Galapagos mangrove ecosystem. And there's four different species of Galapagos mangroves. There's the white, red, black, and button. And once again, they are halophytic, and this refers to their ability to be able to grow in salt water. And the black mangrove actually has above ground roots that allows them to breathe, right? Um, so they encompass many plant adaptations, in addition to the white grove being able to exude the salt water from the leaves, leaving the salt crystals to allow them to grow in this coastal area. The next main ecosystem is the seashore shrublin'. Um, one of the indicator species is sea purslane, Sesuvium porticulacrustrum. Um, this, the seashore shrublin includes many shrubs and low-growing trees. Um, there is also low precipitation and high heat in this area. It's still very close to the coastal zone, the Galapagos mangrove. And once again, they still include that saltwater adaptation because the winds are bringing in the salt water, the air salt air from the ocean. And some indicator species of these are the Hippomae manicella, the poison apple, named because the fruit is toxic. So if you see it, don't eat it. Um, may look pretty, but it's not. <laughs> and then uh, actually the scientific name manicella is in reference to the Spanish name for apple, so manzanilla. Next is the salt bush, Cryptocarpus piriformes. The salt bush named also because it's very tolerant of salt. And then the last one is the Scudia spicata. The fruit of Scudia spicata, the spiny bush, is um, food for many finches, iguanas, and other native animals to the island. And um, so plants usually develop spines as a way to either defend themselves or to conserve water. And so it's probably probable that the Scudia spicata develops spines to, do in this, to conserve water in this area because it is a very high heat and low precipitation area. The next ecosystem zone is our dry forest. So this is the most extensive zone throughout the Galapagos, through all the islands. And the primary area in the zone is, it lies in that rain shadow we talked about before. Um, and so you can see the shadow here where most of the zone is in this rain shadow. And this is the island of Santa Cruz. Some indicator species of this are the acacia. We've seen several of these and the Pisidia carthenogenesis, also called ironwood because the wood is also used in construction of houses and boats in the Galapagos Islands. And then some other indicator species, Palo Santo, Bursura graviolens, this is the incense tree. Palo Santo translates to um, holy wood and it is used um, against like bad energy or you can use it as an incense because when you, some of you did smell it when you break the, the or when you get some sap, it has a very nice aroma. And then we have the prickly pear cactus, Apuntia. Some of the species of Apuntia are only found in the Galapagos Islands. And the Apuchi cactus contains two types of roots. It contains more shallow roots to really um, get the, the moisture from the soil up above. And it contains one deeper root that goes dig down, digs down in search for water. Um, and so this is its mechanism against like the high heat and low precipitation in this area. And the Apuntia is also food for um, a lot of native animals like the tortoise. And then our next ecosystem is the transition forest. So this is the place where the wet and dry climates kind of meet in the Galapagos Islands. So we start to see a taller canopy and a lot more precipitation in this area as a result. So we're transitioning right from that dry lowlands to the humid highlands in this case. And so two main indicator species are pega pega, which translates to sticky sticky. In ref this is the seeds, so the seeds are sticky and the, so they'll stick like to the animal fur or to your clothes. And then the cat's claws and the Stanthocylum vagara. And the cascola also largely defines that brown zone we talked about previously that's only found in Santa Cruz. The evergreen forest, um, the evergreen forest is typically in the classification of zones. We separate the scalacea and the myconia from each other, but there's also a lot of intersection between these two. So we, they've been pushed into the evergreen zone in this case, but it is dominated by scalacea and myconia forest. And these are two plants that are endemic to the Galapagos Islands. Once again, we start to see much more higher precipitation in this area, right? Because we've transitioned from the dry lowlands to the humid highlands. And additionally, the canopy is much taller and we start to see a presence of epiphytes, so in the trees. So in this case, you can see the epiphytes growing on the scalacea tree. And so, like I said previously, the two main plants we will see in this area are the Myconia robinsonia, the Myconia plant, or the daisy tree, Scalacea pedunculata. This is actually a photo of me when I was here. I got to help in a restoration project in planting Scalacea trees in the highlands. So that was really neat. 
And our final zone are the humid highlands, where we've reached the top, the most humidity, but we've lost that tall canopy. So at the top, where the highest ecosystem is, it's mostly now dominated by ferns, mosses, sedges, and lichens. And so it's not as much of a taller canopy anymore. However, this area is also very highly threatened by invasive plants now, right? So in the lower regions, we see a lot more of specific climate. It's very dry. But in the highlands, we see much more moisture. And so because of this, we see a lot more invasion of plants that are not native to the Galapagos Islands. And so two um, indicator species would be the bracken fern. And so here's the fern right here in the front. This is a photo I took when I was here. And then the Cyanathe weather biana tree. This is the only tree you would see in this region. Remember I said it's dominated by ferns. Um, and this can only grow up to nine feet tall. So the only tree is very still low growing compared to leaf deer tree. This photo is in the agricultural area, which is why you see other trees here too. So it's very much been invaded by other plants. And when we talk about ecosystems, it's also important to remember that a lot of the islands, or all the islands are not exactly the same, right? So we have an island like Española, which doesn't even have a human highlands, right? <clears throat> As we talked about previously. And not all islands will exhibit all of these zones all the way up. So there is an intermixing of zones. But traditionally, these are the zones we talk about in the Galapagos Islands because there are indicator species that we see for these zones. And when talking about plants, we have to talk about native plants, right? And so in the Galapagos Islands, we see over 600 species of native plants. And the definition of a native plant is an organism that occurred naturally and was not introduced by humans. So it was brought by an animal, or it was brought by the wind, or other force of nature. And more specifically, you also have a definition for native plants called endemic. So when we further classify plants as endemic, this means they're only found in one location in the world. So in our case, it's only found in the Galapagos Islands. And so in the Galapagos Islands, there's over 180 species of endemic plants to the Galapagos. But what's really unique is there's over there's seven genus of plants. So remember our classification system is genus species with the last two. So genus encompasses a lot more species than just a species. And so these, these are the seven genuses of plants. And four of them are in the aster family, so the, or the sunflower family, asteraceae, or the sunflower kind, which is really unique. And then two of them are in the cactus kind, the brachiocereus and the jasminocereus, the candelabra cactus. And then one is in the pump, pumpkin gourd, gourd kind. So once again, I mentioned this earlier, when we have this zonation, we see a trend in regards to diversity and endemism. So endemism, remember plants that are only found in the Galapagos. And this is because the lower zones are much more specific and harsh for plants. They're much more dry, low precipitation, a lot more heat. And so because of this, we see a lot more plants that are more endemic to the lower zones, whereas the, whereas the plant diversity increases the higher you get because there's a lot more moisture. And as a result, it is high, more highly invaded in the upper portions as compared to the lower um, zones in the Galapagos. So this is a really unique, you know, reverse trend in plant diversity and endemism. And when we're talking about endemic genus two, I have to mention the Scalacea. So Scalacea are known as Darwin's finches of the plant world. So remember when we learned about the finches yesterday, or two days ago, and we talked about adaptive radiation, right? This is the ability of a plant to really diversify into multiple ecological niches and also exhibit a lot of variety. And so just like we see, you know, Darwin's finches having a wide variety of beaks depending on what food it's eating. We also see a um, different variety of leaves. These are all 15 species of Scalacea, and each leaf is very unique, which I think is very, very neat. But then also, the Scalacea is able to inhabit multiple ecosystems. So we talked about the Scalacea zone. So in the highlands, it grows to a very tall tree. But in the lowlands, it can also be found as a small shrub. So it's really neat how the Scalacea have been able to inhabit multiple areas and exhibit a wide variety. However, rather than be proof of evolution, like we talked about with Darwin's finches, God has shown that he has put genetic diversity into his plants to be able to inhabit multiple niches and exhibit a wide variety of diversity. And then on the, in the contrast to native plants, we have non-native plants. So right, if native plants are not introduced by humans, non-natives are classified as organisms that are introduced by humans. And in the Galapagos, there are, over, there are about 870 species of non-native plants, so a lot more than native plants currently. And there are two definitions we can further define on native, native plants. There's naturalized and invasive. Naturalized plants are plants that are not native that have been introduced, but they're not causing any harm to the native species. Currently, they've just kind of become a part of the ecosystem, right? They've 
they're doing their thing, feeding animals, and they're not hurting anything. The invasive plants are the ones that are classified as being harmful to the environment, so they are decreasing native populations and hurting other native organisms in the environment. And once again, this is a chart I showed earlier where we see you know, that trend as, of course, if it's brought by humans, as humans have come to the islands, there's an increase of non-native plants. And so when we talk about threats to our native species, there's a couple. The tortoise hunting, this is when the whalers and the pirates became, they would actually put the tortoises on their ships because they don't require a lot of food and energy. And so they would store them alive on their ships to then eat at a later time. It's a good food source. And then eventually when per permanent human habitation occurred, other threats to native plants also started happening as agriculture was introduced, so did agricultural animals, and then um, additionally plant invasions, so threats to native, not native plants in the form of invasive plants. So the first one I'm gonna talk about are goats. So goats were introduced in the 1800s uh, for agricultural reasons, various reasons. And they soon became a really big problem because as we all know, goats like to eat everything. And so they soon became a problem for the tortoises because they were eating all the grass around them and then they could reach high up in the trees and eat all the leaves. And so they were decreasing tortoise populations and causing destruction to native plants. And so when this became a major problem, they introduced Project Isabella in 1997. And the goal was to eradicate all major um, introduced large animals or mammals from Northern Isabella. And as we can see in this photo here in Santiago too, they also worked in Santiago. Um, this was the highlands with goats and the highlands without goats. So we can see that the goats were really, they were going at it with the, with the plants up there. And so the first stage of the project was to hunt all the goats by land and air. Um, and so by land, they were literally in helicopters shooting down the goats from the islands. But then when that was done, they sent out what they called Judas goats. So in reference to Judas from the Bible, they put tracking collars on these sterile goats and introduced them into the Santiago area and then Northern Isabella. And then they could track them and find where the rest of the goats were you know, in the islands. And so then they were able to eliminate the rest. And the project was successful as it did eliminate all large mammals like donkeys and goats in Santiago. And they did declare Northern Isabella goat free in 2006. And so the next um, major cause I'm gonna talk about is agriculture. So we have the port or the cities in the Galapagos, but we also have our agricultural zones where a lot of people have farms. And when they brought farms, they brought a lot of non-native vegetation and plants and then also animals. And so in this case, in this chart, the yellow are crops and the orange are the non-native invasive plants that were introduced in San Cristobal in the agricultural area. So once again, we just see that, you know, they're just, spreading really rapidly. And finally, I'm gonna talk about a couple invasive plants in the Galapagos. The first case study is blackberry. Blackberry currently, Rubus nivius, is a huge invader in the Galapagos. It is very versatile. It can, the, uh, first of all, the fruit is delicious, right? And so the finches love the fruit. So they spread in that way. Um, they also have a very large seed bank currently in the ground, up to 12 years. So if you, even if you were to remove all of them, they'd grow right back because of the seed bank. They can grow fast and dense thickets up to four feet high. And um, they also have vegetation, vegetative growth. So if you cut a piece off and stuck it in the ground, you'd have a new bush. Um, and so because of this, it's very hard to get rid of. It's very time consuming and costly. You have to manually pull it up by the roots and it's covered in thorns, so very hard. Um, so a lot of people classify it right as the perfect invader. Also, it's known as a transformer species. So the transformer species is something that has come in and completely changed the soil composition and the environment and created what people are now defining as a novel ecosystem. So it's created a new ecosystem in this case since it's become so widespread. Um, a study found that it was harming the Scalacea populations in Santa Cruz, and Scalacea is a very unique plant, right, the endemic genus. Um, and so the blackberry has become a pretty big problem in the Galapagos Islands. So next I'm gonna talk about Cinchona pubescens, or quinine tree. It was first introduced in Santa Cruz in 1940s for the quinine. At the time, quinine was a good remedy for malaria, and so they introduced it as a form of creating quinine for malaria so that they could 
create revenue off of it. But it also, once again, quickly spread from the agricultural areas it was introduced, and particularly in the fern and shrub landscape in Santa Cruz too. Um, and once again, this photo shows the 1972 versus 2007, where the quinine tree has grown and dispersed. And it's this transformer species again, where it's changed soil composition and it's created this novel ecosystem that's brand new. Um, studies have found that it is significantly reducing native populations also. And finally, we're gonna talk about the Spanish cedar, or Cedrilla odorata. It is also very highly invasive, like all these plants. So it was first introduced in the 1940s, also, like the quinine tree, as a source of timber. Because um, the cedar tree is really good wood, so they would use it for exporting timber, but also building their houses. A study found that the Cedrilla tree was blocking tortoise migration routes. And so here we have the gray are the migration routes, and the black are the ones that run through Cedrilla forests. And so they found that the tortoises were avoiding the Cedrilla forest for three main reasons. Um, either the, the Cedrilla forest, um, the way it grows, it promotes the growth of other non-native plants underneath, like Rubus nivius, so it was too dense that the tortoise couldn't get through. Um, they couldn't, either they couldn't maintain their body temperature under the forest too, because there was more shade. And the third reason is that um, the cedrella also reduces like ground vegetation for the food that they do eat. So there was no food under the forest for them to eat through these routes. But another thing that's also complicated with cedrella is it is classified as a vulnerable species um, because it was being exploited for its timber. So we have a vulnerable species in Galapagos that's also classified as invasive and preventing tortoises from migrating. So there's this, you know, hard, I guess, how do you take care of this problem kind of thing. Um, because if it's vulnerable, we don't want to reduce its populations more. And one thing I wanted to touch on too, we've talked a lot about invasives versus non-natives versus natives and naturalized, but when I first heard the term invasive, I was a little confused by the definition because they defined it as something that was introduced by a human, right? And once again, we have this clash of man's word versus God's word. And if you believe that we, or I guess I was confused because if you believe, what have our guys been calling us the whole time, right? Homo sapiens. So if you believe we're an animal and a native plant is something that's brought by an animal, why is an invasive plant something that's brought by a human, right? It doesn't make sense if you believe in evolution and you believe in man's word, that we're just animals, Right? What was yeah. it? Molecules to man. We brought the plants, so if an animal brought a plant and it's native, why isn't it still native? But then from the Bible, we know that as a result of the fall, there's no longer this perfect ecosystem balance, right? So because this plant is taking over and destroying other plants, we wouldn't have seen that in perfection. There would have been a balance between all plants. And so when you think about invasive plants, it's important to keep this in mind. You know, we are called to be good stewards of con of God's creation. And I myself love sustainability and conservation, you know, because we're called to be good stewards, you know, do what I can to also preserve the environment. But also remember that as a result of the fall, we now have these invasive plants. So are invasive plants invasive? Well, according to definition, yes, but it's just the result of the fall. The plant is introduced by a human, you know, we're called to disperse and spread into the world. Um, and so now we just don't see this ecosystem balance. So it's also important to keep that in mind when we do talk about invasive plants. And I just want to end with Psalms 8, 3 through 5. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So as we've seen so far, and as we continue to see God's creation, just be reminded that we have a creator, and he's amazing, and I really do see God through our creation. So I really just want to end on that note, that as we continue to explore the Galapagos and the amazing plants and animals that God has put here, just be reminded of our creator.